many of you might know, you know, I, I, I declined to come back the last couple of times St. Andrews, I played at St. Andrews, because I made my farewell in 2005, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to come back and dilute that for what it was. It was fantastic then. But when I got the invitation this time to be an honorary citizen of St. Andrews and to be, uh, to follow Bobby Jones and Benjamin Franklin, I've got to come back. So to be back is fantastic. We brought the, we, we brought the weather with us, in case you didn't notice that. But uh, this is about the same weather we had in 2005 when we played, it was beautiful. And, uh, but anyway, it's great to be back. I, uh, we're back, I'm back in the, actually the same hotel room that I was in, which I've, Barbara and I have stayed in every time we've been in St. Andrews. Nice. And we, uh, we're looking forward to a great couple of days. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll take some questions from the floor. We'll start with you, Brian, at the front, please. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, first of all, it's terrific to see you here. Um, you've given us all so many wonderful memories over the years, and for that, we're all in this room eternally grateful for you. Um, but what makes to you, what makes St. Andrews so special? What's so magical about the place? Well, you know, I, you could be part of my speech for tomorrow, but when I came here in 1964, I couldn't have believed that St. Andrews was a, a golf course that would still test the golfers of that time. Now that's what, 60 years ago? Close. Anyway. Uh, I didn't think it could, it still tests the golfers this time. It's a magical golf course that's really, uh, the, the conditions, the weather, the, uh, uh, where you actually choose to put the pins, uh, how, how, how the, whether the golf course gets dry or whether the golf course gets wet. Uh, all, those, all those things have made St. Andrews a magical place. And to believe that the game of golf essentially started here and uh, it's just, uh, it just, it just absolutely is mind-boggling to me that uh, it still, it still stands up to the golfers of today, and it does. And I tell you, if you, if you get a little bit of weather, any time you get it, you, you tell you real fast how fast it, <laughs> it makes you stand up to it. Do you still get goosebumps when you come into the Oh, I'm, I'm warm today. I'm not going to do that. I'm kidding. Of course, I mean, I, I, I get I thrilled and, I, and so forth about coming. I mean, I drove into town first time I've driven into town in what, 18 years, 17 years, and um, it was it was it was interesting. I threw coming into town and said, "We used to go that way. I don't know if we go this way. Oh, okay, you know." But I mean, it was it was kind of uh, it, it was fun just to come back to see where we were, see the gates, see the come into come into the little curves that we came into, and uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, I always said St. Andrews was a, uh, looked like a, an old gray town until the open came around. All of a sudden, it just lit up like a light. And uh, uh, it was beautiful. And St. Andrews, always the week of the open championship, is always beautiful. I imagine, actually, probably from anybody who comes, who makes a pilgrimage here to play this golf course, feels that way. Yeah. Okay, we'll take the next question. Mark, at the front right, please. Hey, Jack. Uh, you talk about standing up, the course standing up to the players. I'm just wondering, it, it, it's supposed to be potentially pretty calm this week. And with, with the added length that these guys now have, do you wonder how low guys can go on this golf course? Uh, you might shoot low. So what? That's sort of the way I look at it. I mean, uh, they shoot low now com or compared to what they shot, you know, 100 years ago. But, uh, you know, times change. and. Uh, golfers get better, equipment gets better, uh, conditions get better. Uh, they just, you know, shoot low scores. But uh, I don't think I don't think it really makes a whole lot of difference, frankly. It's it's St. Andrews and it's uh, what it is and how it uh, uh, it will it will it will produce a good champion, always has, and uh, that's why I look at it. Okay, next question, Jeff, please. Uh, do you remember when you first came here uh, how, how much you knew uh, about St. Andrews and, and then how, how quickly did your affinity develop for uh, the well, town and the golf course? The only thing I knew about St. Andrews before 
uh, I got here was my father came over with a couple of friends in 1959 when I was at Muirfield. And they came over, and of course they were saying how much, how much trouble they had. And I, and I couldn't understand what, what was your trouble. Well, one of them had three putted 13 times, the other one 14, and the other one 15. Now I understood why they had trouble. So, uh, but then I came back in 64, and that's all I really knew about it, other than the home. And of course Arnold came here in 60, uh, lost by a shot to kill Nagel. And uh, you know, that's what I knew about St. Andrews. I knew about St. Andrews, obviously, from previous years, but that's really what my knowledge was. So when I stepped on in 64, all of a sudden to step out of the clubhouse, step there, look at the first tee, look at what was there, see the town, see the thing. I fell in love with it immediately. And uh, uh, I've had a love affair with it ever since. Uh, Stephanie, front right, please. Hi, Jack. It's great to see you back in St. Andrews. You've obviously had huge success here uh, over the years, but what does it mean to you to be made an honorary citizen of the town? I, what was the last part? I didn't hear your question. What does it mean to you to be made an honorary citizen of the town? Well, I think that's pretty special. That's why I'm back, obviously. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be back. The 150th anniversary and, uh, you know, a lot of other reasons in the, the tournament and the, the whole thing. But this is why I'm back, I'm back because of that. I wouldn't be back any, for the other reason. But uh, uh, that's, that's pretty special. I mean, there's only uh, two Americans ever been honored. I think I'd, I'd have to uh, think that that's something pretty special. I think I'm very flattered by that, and I thought that was very, uh, very. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a very humbling experience tomorrow. Okay, next question, Juan, back right. So, so the fact that we can still measure the best golfers of the world in this golf course in St. Andrews over all these decades. I'm, not, I'm not understanding that, it at all. That the fact that we can measure who are the best golfers in the world in, still in St. Andrews, in the same scenario than 50 years ago, or over the time, no? And, and maybe the materials and the distance and other things have changed, but you can still compare the magic of somebody playing here 50 years ago with the magic of somebody playing here now, or the touch, or the grit, or all these things, no? Of a champion. I'm trying to figure out what you're asking me. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain. The magic of the guys so, who played here six so, years ago? No. Or 60 years ago. So 60, from, 60, from 60 yeah. years ago, you can't compare the touch of somebody yeah, the game, 60 years the game ago has, with the touch now. No, so, the yeah. game has changed quite a bit, but St. Andrews hasn't. That's it, yeah. And, and sure, St. Andrews has had a little bit of length added to it. Yeah. The old course has, but the guy, it's, 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 the length has been added you know, to try to sort of uh, compromise the golf ball of today. And the, uh, but it's still, you know, you still got to play golf. You still, you still have those, those pesky little bunkers out there that grab your ball every time you hit an errant shot. And, you know, you hit one out there and you play it out sideways and you say, why did I hit it here? Well, somebody hit it here 60 years ago or 100 years ago and they had the same problem. They hit it right out here sideways. They got in your way and, and they haven't really, I, mean, I don't know whether they changed any locations. I think they changed a few locations, but. Not, not a dramatic number, but uh, I think I think the uh, the beardies were changed a little bit back about midway when I was playing, and uh, but the uh, you know you still got to play golf. If you really play well and play smart at St Andrews, you're playing like you do at most of the seaside golf courses. You're playing by where the bunkers are, and you're playing. You know, if, if you play smart, you know really play smart, you're going to probably take a couple of chances during the week, but most of the time you don't. In other words, well, like, when I won at, Muir, at Muirfield, I had planned myself out and I had four drivers a day. And the last day I had a little wind in my face at, at 14 and I elected instead of hitting three, would I hit driver? And I knocked it right in a friggin' bunker. It almost cost me the tournament. You know, discipline is such an important part of playing over here. And you get frustrated. Once you get frustrated, then, then, then say, bye-bye, we'll see you next time. Because that's what happens. You've got to just be patient, and you've got to really just sort of uh, play, play by what, what the golf course gives you. You can't try to take any more. Okay, uh, next question. Alex, in the middle, please. Yeah, Jack, you have a philosophy on how to play Augusta National. 
and when guys come to you, you explain to them what you would do necessarily. What's your philosophy around here? Well, I just went through it a little bit. I mean, basically, it's by where the bunkers are. I mean, the first hole, uh, I just make sure that I take a club and I can't reach the, uh, the burn on the left as, as it comes back. So, I mean, I, you could drive it down there, but you've got plenty of room to drive it down there. But why hit it there? You're only going to play a, a wedge from just short of that. And, you know, the second hole, you really are dealing with, uh, uh, what's the, I, don't, I can't remember the name of the bunker that sits out of the turns on, the, on, on number two. But you're playing by that. And, of course, on the right. You're playing, always playing, trying to play in between what your hazards are. Uh, St. Andrews is, what is it? St. Andrews is only about 94 acres, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty small. It's not yeah, a big piece of land. Very small piece of property. And, of course, it just goes out and comes back. And you, your width is what you have between, you know, two holes. Every hole adds up to 18. Every green does. And so you, you, try, to, you try to keep it in, just keep it in between that. I mean, St. Andrews is played to the left. And if you're going to miss it, you miss it left. And most, most, most of the time, and there's occasionally there's a bad problem left, but not too often. Most of your problems are right. You're out of bounds, and your big bad bunkers and so forth are on the right. And so you, the philosophy is to keep the ball favoring the, the center of the golf course, play the club that, that, that you need to play off the tee that doesn't get you in a bunker. Uh, as it relates to the greens, uh, you're going to get the ball on the green. It's just, you know, whether you can putt or not. Uh, first, first time I played here in, in, in 64, let's see, I think I was one, 149, I think, the first two rounds, and I'd had uh, 41 putts. And that's, that's what you have in the wind, and it was bad weather. And I played, I shot 66, 68 the last two rounds. And wind dropped out, and then I made, made some putts. But putting is really difficult in the wind. And particularly on this, on this golf course, because the wind just sort, of, just sort of pushes it across the green. Uh, so you, you've, got, you've, got, you've got to figure out that uh, uh, you, you, you try not to leave a ball at a place where you leave yourself an impossible putt. In other words, like at number two, you've got the Himalayas. You don't, you, I don't think you want to leave the ball where you're putting out of there. You want to try to hit the ball, keep the ball to the right of it, so you're putting back up into, 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 the, into, the, uh, into the hill. It's the same type of thing pretty much through the golf course. Right? A third hole, I guess, has that little bunker on the left. You've got to hit, that, hit the ball. You just don't want to ever be in that bunker. Short side yourself. You've got to be to the right of that little bunker so, you, so you're not paying off, off of the slope. And it's right, all through the golf course, Alex, it's the same thing. Okay, Doug, we'll go with you next, please. First of all, Jack, following up on, on Memorial, have you made a birdie this year? I made a birdie uh, last weekend. I looked out for a hole in one, and I left it that far away, and I could, fortunately got it in. <laughs> Playing with Gary, Gary says, I'm not going to make you putt that. He says, that's good. So I did make a birdie. Very I played, good. I played nine holes well, since, um, since the Memorial. The, um, I wanted to ask you as many memories as you have here. What, what, are your, what would be your one single probably strongest memory of St. Andrews? And, and if you could oh. remember, what would be the one shot you'd love to have back? One shot I would love to have back? Uh, I don't think I have any here, Doug. Uh, I mean, I wasn't going to win in 64. Uh, I think Sanders would like to have his putt back in 70. I don't want to give that back to him. Uh, you know, I felt bad for him, but you know, it's 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 golf. You still got to get a finish in the last hole. And uh, 78, I didn't really have it. I mean, I won by a couple of shots, but I just stayed in front of the field the last nine holes. And I was—I don't think I was ever in contention again. So I don't really have anything I'd like to have back. Well, I suppose I do. I I, I, I try to avoid hell whenever I can. I think I took about four shots to get out of that one. In '95, but you've had—I guess you've had the, the the two wins here, and then an a incredibly warm reception when you finished here in '05. Do, do any do any of those three years, I guess, stand out? Any over what, the others? Doug? Any of those three years or moments stand out over the others? Well, probably '78, I suppose. I mean, '70 came back because of, you know, I'd won at St. Andrews, and that's Jones had always said, you know, that uh, uh, a golfer's resume is not complete unless he's won at St. Andrews. 
And so that was, that was 70, but 78 people were just unbelievable. I mean, they were out hanging off the rooftops, out the windows, uh, you know, walking up the 18th ferry, the last hole was dangerous, and people were running all over you. They, had, you know, I don't know how many security guys I had trying to keep the people off of off of us. And then, of course, me is my typical. I'm I'm sitting there, got tears running down my eyes as I as I'm walking up because I I get pretty sentimental about that kind of stuff. And I remember my caddy Jimmy hit me on the back. He's Laddie, he says, we got another hole to finish. Get with it. <laughs> so anyway. OK, next question, move to the right, please, Ewan. Jack, um, Greg Norman is going to be a pretty notable absentee from past champion events here this week. Can I ask what you make of that situation? Is it sad? I don't know much about it, to be very honest with you. Well, he, the RNA did not invite him to the past champion dinner or past? Uh, I, don't, I really don't know anything about what they did. OK. I mean, I know that they did that, but I don't know anything. I don't know anything more than that. Do you, do you think his reputation has been harmed or, or affected by his, Greg's reputation? Do you think it has been harmed or affected by his involvement with the Live Golf? Well, let me just sum this up with, one, with a couple of words. First of all, uh, Greg Norman's an icon in the game of golf. Okay? He's a great player. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. And regardless of what happens, he's going to remain a friend. And he and I just, but unfortunately, he and I just don't see eye to eye in what's going on. I basically leave it at that. Okay? That fair enough? Uh, Steve, in the middle there, back, please. Jack, back in the day after 70 and 78, did you put anything in the claret jug for a special drink? I or had did never put anything in the claret jug. I, I know it's a claret jug, but I always thought it was disrespectful to be drinking out of it. But I see guys that have done it to, in the future in the past, but I always respected it. You know, they, they, they cleaned it out before I got there, and I didn't want to dirty it up. Did your kids have any uh, moments with it? Did your kids, I'm sorry? Did your kids have, how, what was your kids' reaction to the claret jug? My kids' reaction? Well, they, they just looked to see if there was any wine in it. If there wasn't any wine, they didn't care about it. Is that about right? No, I, I, I never used the claret jug for anything other than uh, what it symbolized. Champion golfer of the year, and I'm delighted to have been able to retain that twice. Here, three times the same with Muirfield. Okay, uh, and Matt, right at the back there, please. Yeah, given the uh, historic significance of what's going to happen tomorrow, wonder if you could talk about your relationship, your memories of Bob Jones. Well, I mean, I can go for hours on Bob Jones, but I go back to 1955. When I first met uh, Mr. Jones, uh, we, I was playing at the uh, U.S. Amateur. I was 15 years old at the Country Club of Virginia, James River course. And it was a sort of a windy last practice round. And I hit, there's a long par four, and I hit a three wood into the green and got it on the green. And there was this gentleman in a cart, and I didn't know what Bob Jones looked like at the time. And he was there, and, uh, and I finished the round. They said, Jack, uh, Mr. Jones would like to say hello to you. Okay, so I went over to the cart and he said, "Jack, I'm I'm, I'm Bob Jones." I said, "Because I've been here for a little over an hour." And he says, "You're only the third person that's reached the screen in two today. Congratulations!" I said, "That's thank you, sir." I left. That was about it. We went to dinner that night. He was a speaker at the dinner. After the dinner, we were walking out, and he caught up with me. My dad, my father was with me. He got up with me and he said, uh, you know, he said, Jack, he says, I, said, I think I'm going to come out and watch you play a few holes tomorrow. I'm okay. Bob Jones is going to come out and watch me, 15-year-old Jack Nicholas, play, play some holes. Well, anyway, I kept looking over my shoulder. And I, was, I had Bob, Bob Gardner, who was in a, Bob Gardner was a Walker Cup and, and a World Cup player, uh, who I played with later. And I had him one down after 10. So I was doing pretty well. On down the 10th ferry came this cart, and it was Bob Jones. And uh, uh, we got there, and he watched me play 11, 12, and 13. I went bogey, bogey, double bogey. He looked at my dad, and he said, Charlie, he says, I don't think I'm doing Jack much good here. So he excused himself. I left. I got back to, actually got back to even, and uh, I lost the last hole. But uh, that was my first experience with Jones. The second experience was 1957, and uh, 
he came to the USG, or, or US uh, JC Juniors at Ohio State when I was 17. And uh, uh, he presented the trophy, and we had a nice conversation and so forth there. And then when I qualified for the Masters, there was a note in my locker. Jack, he says, well, I'd like to have you and your father come down and see me at my cabin during the tournament. That was a very nice gesture. And so, so we went down, and uh, that gesture was there every year. And so I really got to know quite a bit about him. He'd talk about his stories, talk about Sterling Maiden, talk, talk about how he had... Uh, we talked well, talk, talk about he won at Scioto in 1926, where I grew up. Uh, the, uh, you know, it was just conversation of how how to play golf and do things and forth, and I and I gleaned a lot from that, and so I just I I, I became a very, uh, you know, big fan of Bob Jones. I was always a big fan, but my dad's idol was Bob Jones. My dad, when they played the Walker Cup match or Ryder Cup matches at Scioto in 1931, and my dad used to look a lot like Jones. He parted his hair in the middle, and he was an 18-year-old kid at the time, and he came walking by the clubhouse. They said, oh, hey, Mr. Jones, come in here. You come in here. So my dad never passed up anything like that. So off he went into the clubhouse as Bob Jones sat down. They ordered him a drink and so forth and so on. Finally, they figured out who he was. Out of here, kid. You know. But anyway, my dad was a big fan, and uh, when I won the Open in 62. Uh, uh, I got a note from Jones right after the, after the Open, and he said, that four-foot putt you hold in 17, he says, when you hold that thing going down the hill, he says, I came right out of the chair, out of my chair. Which obviously he couldn't, but that was his expression of saying he was excited. So we had a very nice relationship, and, uh, uh, you know, we... Uh, I remember the last thing that I, that, I, that I had with Jones was when I turned pro. Well, it wasn't the last thing. But I remember, I forget the letter I have, which I've, I've still got it in a, in a museum, of about how he had hoped that I would remain an amateur. And uh, uh, how, uh, uh, you know, nobody had been in the amateur ranks since he was, and they thought I could really help the game of golf and so forth and so on. And he says, however, as I understand the, uh, what's, what pulls at you to play, professional golf and so forth and so on. And he finished the letter up, he says, you know, he says, I've had an awfully nice relationship with Spalding through all these years. I think you maybe ought to talk with Spalding, which was kind of, kind of funny, because I was getting a big kick out of that. But uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was a good friend. Never saw him hit a shot. Uh, Martin, back left, please. Jack, I can see that you've got a number of family members in the room I can't here. See. Where are we? Jack. I'm right at the back uh, left there, Jack. Right I'm back. sorry? Yeah. I can see you've got a number of family members in the room here today. How important is it for you, for them, to be part of what's happening here in St Andrews this well, week for you? I think it was very special that they wanted to come. Uh, they were here when I finished in uh, 2005, uh, and they're here again today. And that's very special to me. And uh, to think that they want to come watch their old man, you know, say a few words, I think is, is very nice. I was very, very honored by that. Uh, Louine, front left, please. Right here. Um, Jack, when do you think golf was at its most watchable? Was it in, you know, when you were in your head, heyday and there were so many different types of golfers, or do you think it's now? Well, I think golf has gone through a variety of periods. I think Arnold, I mean, golf was golf prior to, Palmer, and you know you knew a little bit about Hogan and Steed and so on, but you never really watched them. Then Arnold came along and they started having television, and uh, Arnold sort of popularized the game from a television standpoint and brought the me more media and more awareness of the game. I think. Uh, I think that the era that we played in was a good era. We had a lot of very good players. Uh, I think then. Then came along Tiger's era. And Tiger had it pretty much by himself for a while. And then when Tiger got hurt, uh, you know, the other guys actually got a chance to win a golf tournament. And uh, uh, they learned how to win. So when Tiger came back, he had some competition. And those guys that learned how to play during that period of time, I think, have come, become a great number of players. There are more good players in the game today than we've ever had. I think the game is, you know, from a television standpoint, good gracious, and a popularity standpoint. Uh, what COVID, you know, is really, people flocked to the game of golf with COVID. 
but they've also uh, we've seen we've seen the game grow and see television. Tell you can watch any golf tournament in the world almost today on television, and you turn it on, you say, oh, I want to go watch something in, in Africa, I want to watch something in Europe, I want to watch something in Asia, I want to, no matter where you are, you're, you're going to be able to watch it. And, uh, you know, it continually, that will continue to uh, popularize the game of golf. And so, uh, I'm, I think golf is probably, probably in, as, in as good a state as it's ever been, uh, as far as the growth of the game, and uh, I see that the, uh, uh, Number, number of good players that there are today. I think it's really fantastic. OK, and we'll take our final question. Just back right here, please. Hi, Jack. Uh, I was wondering if you could take your mind back to 1970 on the 18th hole uh, in regulation as well as in the playoff. Because in regulation, you hit it right up on the green or close to it and three-putt it. And of course, I did? Yeah. Oh, I thought you remembered. Sorry. Did I three-putt? <laughs> Well, you were just off the green and three-putted. I just read it in your book, and you were pretty upset. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but then Doug missed his I putt. I didn't remember that three-putt. I thought I, I maybe it was just off the green. I maybe got it up and missed the putt for a birdie. Right, right. But anyway, i just curious, in the playoff, when you took your sweater off, you had that one-stroke lead, and yet went right at the green. I was hot. You, yeah. So if you could just talk about that. How good a shot was that in your memory as, as far as how it ranks with the great shots you hit? Well... Uh, Jaime, in 1964, I drove it on the green all four days. The first round with the driver and the last three rounds with the three wood. Uh, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a big feat to get the ball to the green. Uh, and in uh, 70, I got to the 18th hole, and we were dead down wind, and we were playing from a shorter tee. So it wasn't a matter of getting the ball to the green, I just wanted to be free enough to swing. So I, that's why I took the shirt, the sweater off. And I hit it, of course, we went right on through the green. If it hadn't had the rough behind the green, I think it would have been out of bounds. And uh, uh, you know, I hit a, hit, a, hit a decent chip down to about five feet, and then I made the putt. Uh, that was what I did. And uh, I'm sure I've circumvented your question. What was it? No, it, was, it just it seemed like it was a bold move. You had a one-stroke lead, and yet you hit a very bold shot. And well, what do you want me to do? Lay it up back in the fairway <laughs> and play a, you know, we, that day when we, we, we turned uh, the uh, loop, they, they clocked the wind at 56 mile an hour. So it was really windy. So I had a lot of wind behind me. I, I didn't think I'd want to be pitching into that green, you know. So I wanted to hit the ball into the green, onto the green somewhere so that I, had, I wasn't going downwind. And that, that was sort of my thought process. I didn't, I didn't really dream that I'd knock it through the green, but I hit it pretty good. <laughs> thank you. Well, Jack, thank that you. That was still small ball, Jaime, in 70. Yeah. Jack, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Best right. of luck uh, this afternoon and with the ceremony tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all. Good to see you all again.